What's going on besties? Today we're going to be tackling the T's version 7 science portion, more specifically life and physical science, and we're going to be talking about concepts of Mendel's law of inheritance. Let's get started. For my entire life growing up, I've always been intrigued by the idea of owning a sphinx cat. While they're available at select breeders, they're actually quite rare. Their survival in the wild ultimately seems unlikely. Consider picturing a sphinx cat shivering out in the cold. It's a true testament about their specialized care needs. However, the genetics behind these hairless cats are utterly captivating, just like the cats themselves. Unlike their furry counterparts, sphinx cats lack hair, a trait determined by their genetic makeup. Genes, which are segments of DNA, are passed down from the sphinx kittens from both their mother and their father, dictating everything from their hairlessness to their distinctive appearance. An allele is a variant of a gene often recognized by letters. For our discussion, we're going to use the letter F to represent fur. A sphinx cat, known for its lack of fur, is going to possess two recessive alleles for the fur trait. Recessive alleles are typically indicated by the lowercase letter. Being recessive implies that this trait will only manifest if there are no dominant alleles present. Dominant alleles marked by their uppercase letter are traits that are expressed. In essence, they dominate over the others. Therefore, the sphinx cat lacks the dominant fur gene, allowing the recessive trait of being furless to be expressed. So if we take a look at our guide here, we can see that a sphinx cat is going to have two recessive alleles. Conversely, a long hairs cat genotype can either be two dominant alleles, meaning we have two uppercase letter Fs, or they can have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, meaning they'll have one uppercase F and one lowercase F. Because of that presence of just one dominant allele, that uppercase F, it's sufficient for that furry trait to be expressed, effectively masking that recessive allele. As we dive deeper into genetics, we come across a few terminology. Genotypes capital F, capital F, or lowercase F, lowercase F, are labeled homozygous genotypes, the prefix homo suggesting sameness due to both alleles either being uppercase or lowercase respectively. If we break this down even further, our uppercase F, uppercase F is termed homozygous dominant, reflecting that uppercase notation, while our lowercase F, lowercase F is homozygous recessive, given its lowercase notation. A genotype with an uppercase F and a lowercase F is called heterozygous, where hetero in the beginning of that word means different, indicating that alleles are of different notations. One is uppercase and one is lowercase. If you were to observe a cat with hair, its genotype could either be homozygous dominant or it could be heterozygous. It's indiscernible just by their appearance. However, if we wanted to, we could test to clarify what the exact genotype is. In contrast, the genotype of a hairless sphinx cat is always going to be homozygous recessive, since the presence of any dominant allele, which would be our uppercase F, would ultimately result in a furry phenotype. Let's tackle a mono hybrid cross, where mono signifies the focus of a single trait, in this instance, fur. To analyze this, we are going to construct what we know as a Punnett square. It's divided into four sections, and in this instance, we're going to look at two heterozygous cats being crossed together. Our initial step, step one, is we want to identify the parents' genotypes. In this case, we have two heterozygous cats. For step two, we want to position one parent's genotype at the top of our Punnett square and the other parent's genotype on the side of our Punnett square. Then for step three, we're going to proceed by crossing them, ensuring that whenever we have a dominant allele, that would be our capital F, we're going to list that first for consistency. So this is how we are going to cross them. We are going to multiply the top of the square by the side of the square. So our first example, we have F multiplied by capital F. So we'd have a capital F, capital F. For our next, again, we're gonna multiply the top of this square by the side of this square, and that is going to give us capital F, 
lowercase f. Then we're going to multiply the top of this square by the side of this square. And that is going to give us capital F, lowercase f. And then lastly, we're going to multiply the top of this square by the side of this square. And that is going to give us lowercase f, lowercase f. The resulting squares are going to reveal the potential genotypes of these cats' offspring. If you were asked on your T's what the offspring's genotypes would be, you could say that you have one cat that is going to be homozygous dominant. You're going to have two cats that are going to be heterozygous, and you're going to have one cat that is going to be homozygous recessive. This outcome can also be expressed as a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, or 25% capital F, capital F, 50% capital F, lowercase f, and 25% lowercase f, lowercase f. Now we're going to shift our focus to phenotype. But what exactly is a phenotype? The term phenotype can be remembered by associating pheno with physical appearance. So p and pheno, p and physical, that's how I like to remember that this is a observable characteristic of an organism. In this scenario, the trait in question is the presence or absence of fur. Given that the presence of at least one dominant allele, that would be our capital F, results in fur, offspring with the genotypes capital F, capital F, or capital F lowercase f are going to indeed have fur. Thus, three of our offspring are going to display that furry phenotype. Our homozygous recessive kitten, which is our lowercase f, lowercase f, ultimately lacks that dominant allele. So this cat is going to result in a hairless phenotype. Therefore, we can describe the phenotype distribution as three furry to one fur less, or we can even break it down into percentages. 75% are going to have fur and 25% are going to be hairless. It's crucial to remember that Punnett squares offer predictions based on probabilities, not certainties. They're ultimately going to indicate potential outcomes rather than guaranteeing specific results. For instance, while there's theoretically a 50 to 50% 50 chance of a child being born male or female, many of us are familiar with families that have only daughters or only sons. These outcomes show the nature of probabilities as they forecast the possible event, adding an element of unpredictability. Until now, we've concentrated on only one single allele pairs, which is why we have been talking about monohybrid crosses, mono standing for one. However, cats possess a multitude of traits beyond just their fur status each influenced by their own alleles. When we examine a cross involving two different pairs of alleles, we often refer to this as dihybrid cross. The prefix di indicates two, so we're looking at two distinct traits. So I want you to picture this. There's a cat named Oreo, named for its black and white patched appearance, reminiscent of a cookie. Or admittedly, we just couldn't come up with a more original name. Now imagine beginning your day, walking into the living room to relax with your morning cup of coffee, only to find that your cat, Oreo, meticulously knocked your favorite mug off the coffee table. As you attempt to tidy up, you notice that Oreo is now pushing your pen off your desk. It's clear that not all cats are going to share in this behavior of playful disruption, but Oreo is irresistibly drawn to it. Day or night, he's irresistibly engaging in little gravity experiments. The origin of this behavior intrigues us. Is it genetic? Probably not. But let's practice dihybrid squares, imagining if playful disruption towards objects were genetic traits. Let's suppose that the enjoyment of causing playful disruptions is a dominant trait denoted by the allele capital D. And its absence, which is a more preference for calm, is a recessive trait symbolized by the allele lowercase d. Imagine that we have a cat that is heterozygous for both the fur trait and the playful disruption trait. Being heterozygous for both traits would leave them with a genotype of capital F, lowercase f, capital D, lowercase d. We're going to cross this cat with another cat that is both hairless and prefers calm environments. This means that they're going to have homozygous recessive traits. So they're going to have a lowercase f, lowercase f for the fur trait, and they're going to have a lowercase d, lowercase d for the playful disruption trait. 
Now, in Mendel's law of independent assortment, it suggests that traits are inherited independently of one another, indicating there's no genetic link between having fur and enjoying playful disruptions, for example. This means that a cat may enjoy playful disruptions regardless if they have fur or they don't. We're going to apply this principle to die hybrid cross. Here, we have a setup of a 16 square Punnett square. Our very first step is we wanna begin by establishing the parents' genotypes for our cross, which we have in our example here on the left-hand side of our screen, like we discussed before. Step number two is we wanna determine the gamete combinations from each parent and place them alongside the top and the side of our Punnett square. But ultimately, how do we determine what letters to place there? We employ the FOIL method, which helps us figure out the possible gamete combinations. The FOIL acronym stands for first, outside, inside, and last. Let's take a look at each of these of how we determine our gamete combinations. Starting with our first cat, we are going to multiply the first letter of each one of our traits. This would be our capital F and our capital D, which would give us capital F, capital D. Next, we are going to multiply the outside of each one of our traits. That would be our capital F and our lowercase d, ultimately giving us this gamete formation. Then we have the inside. So we're gonna multiply the inside of our formation here, which would give us lowercase f, capital D. And then lastly, we would multiply the last traits, which would be our lowercase f, lowercase d, ultimately giving us our final gamete combination. If you take a look at our last example, because everything is homozygous recessive, we don't have to do a whole lot of groundwork here because our gamete combinations are always going to be lowercase f, lowercase d. Now we're gonna place these alongside our Punnett square. The uniformity of these combinations are gonna highlight the limited allele variation that the parents contribute. And for step three, we're gonna merge the gametes to forecast the potential genetic outcomes that we're gonna see with these cats' offspring. Just like we did with monohybrid cross, we wanna maintain consistency when it comes to formatting. So if we have a capital F or a capital D first, we always wanna make sure that we list those before our lowercase letters. We also wanna make sure that we list our Fs before our Ds, because when we're looking at our combination of our gametes, that is how it's listed with each one of these cats. Ultimately, this method is going to ensure clarity and uniformity by interpreting the Punnett squares results. So just to give you an example, for our first square, we have capital F, capital D here, and we have lowercase f, lowercase d here. We are going to cross these two traits together. So we always wanna start with F, so we have a capital F and a lowercase f. We wanna make sure that capital F becomes comes before the lowercase, and the same thing with our D. We have a capital D and a lowercase d, so we want to list the uppercase letter first and the lowercase letter last. So one more example we have here, same thing. We're going to cross the top of this square with the side of this square. So we have a capital F, lowercase f. We list that in order. And then look here, we have two recessive alleles. We have two lowercase d's. So we're going to list lowercase d and lowercase d. You're going to do this the entire time throughout this, the entirety of this dihybrid cross Punnett square. So we always want to know our genotypes and our phenotypes. So we're gonna start with our genotypes. What genotypes are we going to have with these offspring? So if we take a look at our example, the distribution is as follows. We're gonna have four out of 16 when it comes to capital F, lowercase f, capital D, lowercase d. We are gonna have four out of 16 when it comes to capital F, lowercase f, lowercase d, lowercase d. We're also gonna have four out of 16 of lowercase f, lowercase f, capital D, lowercase d, and again, four out of 16 when it comes to lowercase f, lowercase f, and lowercase d, lowercase d. So the potential genotypes that we could see with these cats is a one to one to one to one ratio. Now let's shift our focus to phenotypes. So in this scenario, we see that about half of our cats are going to be furry, and the other half of our cats are going to be furless. However, that's not the only thing that we're gonna be testing with dihybrid cross. We also wanted to see the likelihood that the kitten was gonna be born with characteristics similar to Oreo or not. So listen here with the use of polka dots, we can see that our pink polka dots, which is in this column, 
and this column show that there's going to be an 8 and 16 chance that they're going to be like Oreo. And with our blue polka dots in this column and this column, there's an 8 and 16 chance that they're going to be calm. If we break this down by their two traits, we can see that 25% are going to be furry and playful. 25% is going to be furry and calm. 25% are going to be fur less and playful. And another 25% are going to be fur less and calm. This ultimately leaves us with another ratio of 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 when it comes to our cat's phenotypes. It's crucial to note that in this particular case, the genotype and the phenotype ratios align, but this is not always the case. Whenever we're mixing two heterozygous cats together, we usually see a ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. But in this case, we had one heterozygous cat and one homozygous recessive cat. The key takeaway from this is that Punnett squares serve as a tool for estimating the probabilities of offspring inheriting specific genotypes or phenotypes. It's going to offer a glimpse of the intriguing dynamics of genetics. What links the color of flowers and human height together? They both serve as prime examples of non-Mendelian inheritance. This term refers to genetic traits that defy the conventional Mendelian principles where the presence of a dominant allele guarantees that expression of the dominant trait. Let's take a look at roses with the following three phenotypes, red, white, and an immediate hue of pink. This phenotype is known as incomplete dominance. In cases of incomplete dominance, there's a twist. The allele typically seen as dominant doesn't fully overshadow our so-called recessive allele when they coexist. In fact, the concept of dominant alleles becomes a little murky here. For instance, when the red flower genotype, capital R, capital R, and the white flower genotype, lowercase r, lowercase r, result in offspring that are both capital R, and lowercase r, they don't conform to that Mendelian expectation. Instead of that dominant r overpowering the recessive r to produce red flowers, it now actually manifests our pink flowers. This blending effect signifies incomplete dominance. Should two pink flowers be crossed, like we see here in our last example, this blending effect signifies incomplete dominance. Should we cross two pink flowers like we see here in our last Punnett square, the offspring could be red, they could be pink, or they could even be white, showcasing the diverse outcomes when it comes to incomplete dominance. And lastly, we have co-dominance. So the prefix co in co-dominance suggests cooperation or working together, which aptly describe how the alleles interact in this scenario. Unlike with incomplete dominance, where one allele's expression is not entirely masked by the other, co-dominance involves both alleles being expressed equally and independently. To illustrate this, let's consider the genetic crossing of certain chickens. When a black chicken with the genotype capital B, capital B is crossed with a white chicken with the genotype capital W, capital W, the resulting offspring are going to exhibit the genotype capital B, capital W. These capital B, capital W chickens are going to display both black and white feathers with a speckled pattern. This simultaneous expression of both traits without blending or dilution amplifies co-dominance, a situation where both alleles contribute to the phenotype in a distinctly visible manner. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding Mendel and non-Mendelin's law of inheritance. If you have any questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to nursechungstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources to help you ace that ATITs exam the first time. And as always, I'll catch you in the next video. Bye!